Well, hello everyone and welcome back to the channel and more importantly, back to this, the latest generation Range Rover, the L460. If you've been paying attention to the channel, you'll have noticed a few videos with this car over the past few weeks. Now, this was lent to me by a fantastic rental service called The Out, and I'll tell you a little bit more about them later. But first, I want to go into a little bit more depth about this car specifically, because the past two videos on the channel I've featured this car in, well, firstly was all about the car being delivered and just going over some of its features and the color and how it looks, which is incredibly exciting. And then even more excitingly, we took the car to Scotland on an adventure to find and to show my wife some of the most beautiful parts that that country has to offer. However, today, after completing almost 2,000 miles in the car over the time that I've had it and, and many, many, many hours behind the wheel, and also from the perspective of someone that's owned Range Rovers previously and spent some time in the previous generation, I think I might have some useful insight or experience that I should disclose to you guys. Maybe you're just enthusiasts or maybe you're looking to buy one of these cars or maybe you own an L405 and you're thinking about upgrading. I think I might have some useful insights for you. So that's what this video is going to be all about because being totally honest with you, although this is by far and away probably the best car I've ever driven, it's not without its faults. And there's a few which I think are kind of annoying and problematic. On the contrary though, I have a lot of fantastic things to say about this car. And uh, I want to go into more detail about those points today as well. Starting outside the car then, and the thing you'll become most immediately aware of is the size of this Range Rover. Now, I'm not the largest chap in the world, I'm first to admit that. I'm around five foot nine, but however, this thing is absolutely massive and it's currently in access mode, which is its lowest suspension setting. It's a huge car. Now, dimensions wise, it's not much different to the generation before it. However, when you're behind the wheel, it just feels really large. I, I wonder if it's because it's lost a little bit of that boxiness that the generations before had, which made it just effortless to place it on the road. You knew exactly where each corner of the car was, certainly with the L322. However, it doesn't seem to be the case with this car. From my experience driving it, especially when you get onto country roads as we have around me here, it gets a little bit sketchy. And it's actually the first car I've ever driven where I've been a little bit nervous. You know, I'll see something coming the other way in any other car and just be quite happily, you know, maintaining my speed as I know I'm going to get through the gap. But in this, it's different. I've never had a car where I felt the need to really really be careful about whether I'm going to hit something. It feels it feels gigantic and, and it is. It is a very big car, but it just has a way of, uh, of not masking that size as much as the previous generations. Speaking of the general appearance of this car, though, I have to say I think they've absolutely nailed it. Now, when the first press shots came out and the first videos started coming onto YouTube, of this car. I thought they'd ruined it, to be honest. I thought they'd sort of lost that utilitarian sort of look and the ruggedness that the old Range Rovers had. But having spent time around this one and seeing more on the road, I just think, I think it's gorgeous, actually. I think it's the first truly pretty Range Rover. And that might not be what you want, but I think that is the way that JLR are going. They're trying to appeal to that more sort of luxurious market. But regardless of their marketing direction and their design direction. I personally just think it's very, very pretty front and back. Now the Range Rover Sport, I've not spent any time around and I'm not sure about the back of that car. However, I'm sure if I did have one for a number of weeks, I'd learn to really like it as I have with this car. I think it's beautiful. And of course this Belgravia green paintwork, which I actually chose, I have to say really, really suits it. My only problem with this paintwork is that when the car gets dirty, it sort of becomes, well, quite dim, quite almost looks black or dark gray. But when it's clean and it's a sunny day like this, which is absolutely stunning today, it really gleams and I think really suits the car. So this particular car then is riding on these 22 inch wheels. I have to say they're not really my first choice. However, at least they're not black because I think when you have black alloys on a Range Rover, for the most part, in my opinion, it seems to sort of spoil the regal nature of the car. But I think these, these wheels were chosen as an option on this car because it's only the HSE spec, which isn't the highest, but I believe these wheels would have been an optional extra. 
Not the ones I would have chosen, like I say, but there are many, many other choices. And we'll go into it in a little more detail when I drive the car, but I have to say, it doesn't seem apparent that these are spoiling the ride quality in any way, shape or form. If it was me, I'd probably just choose the smallest wheels possible. But when you stand at the side of this Range Rover, you can see it's all just sort of blended now into one smooth bubble, which I think is what makes it perhaps prettier, but maybe less easy to place on the road. The windows, for example, just blend straight into the doors now. There's no sort of rubber lip or sill that goes around the outside. I do like this black side skirt on this particular car. I think it looks fantastic. However, this one is missing for me deployable side steps. Now you can get them optioned on these cars. And they essentially are side steps that come out when you open the door or unlock the car, which makes it a lot easier to get in. For me, that's an absolute must if you have one of these because I can try and demonstrate now, even in access mode, it is a little bit of an uncomfortable hike to get in to the Range Rover. So for me, having some side steps here would make that a lot more comfortable. And now it wouldn't really be a Range Rover with it without the split folding tailgate, which I'm pleased to say they have of course retained in this latest model, although this one has a little bit of a mind of its own. I do find it's one of my frustrations with this car, and to be honest, it's not fair to just blame the Range Rover, but electronic tailgate cars in general is extremely sensitive. For example, if I just had that bag there, it probably wouldn't want to close and it would beep at me and you end up spending about a minute trying to get the thing to work in this case it's okay but trust me over the past week or so with this car there's been many occasions where it's really really frustrated me that it won't just close but anyway yes we do have the split folding tailgate and this one although it doesn't have the optional seat flap that you can lift here it does still have the cup holders and is still a very comfortable place to sit now also a nice addition on this car in particular is electronic rear seat folding. You press these two buttons here and the rear seats just go down automatically, which is very, very useful. Now, I think you could have that on the L405 and maybe even some L322s, but I'm pretty sure they're standard here on the Range Rover. More importantly, you can just pull them and they come back up, which is very, very useful. I do also like this, it's quite fun, that you can lower and raise the air suspension while it's sat in the back of the car. Obviously, it's not for this purpose, but if you've got sort of heavy things that you need to load into the back, you can bring the ride height right down, making that a lot easier. That's one or two ways in which the technology incorporated into the latest Range Rover is actually quite welcomed. But inside the car, there's quite a few new technological advances, which in my opinion, don't really better the drivability and functionality of the Range Rover. And so I suppose we should jump in and talk about those now. So jumping into this latest generation Range Rover then, you're presented with a number of screens like you never have really had before. The L405 obviously had a central display here, as did the L322. Only later models of the 322 had the glass cockpit display in front, but this time it's all different. And the feature of course here in the L460 is this very large curved central display, which, Fortunately or unfortunately, I would probably say, is where pretty much all of the functionality to Range Rover now lies. They have retained some very useful things, such as the ability to control your heated or ventilated seats from this push button here. You can also access the seat controls by pressing this physical button there. And there is still a physical wheel for choosing the type of program, whether you want grass, gravel, snow, mud ruts, sand, economy, dynamic, as you have had before, there is a physical wheel. Now what they have done away with, which for me was the first thing that I found unusual and then frustrating, is the little button here that you used to have, which you pressed and the car would lower into access mode, which as I mentioned earlier on, Access mode is the lowest ride height setting, which makes it much easier to get in and out of the car, especially when you don't have deployable side steps like this example. Now, there is now no button here to adjust the air suspension into access mode, but there's also no physical button here in the middle where you would have found it before to adjust the ride height. You now have to 
go into this mode, you have to press car, and then you have to select access normal or off-road. Now, I have gotten around that a little bit by making a setting so that every time I switch the car off, it goes into access mode. However, it waits to do that until you've opened the door. So by the time you've sort of opened the door and stepped out the car, you haven't really benefited from the access mode because it's still lowering. Now that might sound very petty, but I think for me, it's actually quite a big deal. It's one of the things I like the most about Range Rover, having the adjustable air suspension and now the ability to adjust it has not been removed, but it's become more convoluted and more difficult and in a way less enjoyable to use. Another thing that they've done is they have retained physical seat control buttons so I can recline my seat, I can adjust the headrest up and down using this. I can also go forwards and backwards, up and down with the base of the seat. However, if I want to adjust anything in terms of lumbar or bolster support, I now have to go into the menu. I have to click adjust, and then I have to pick the part of the seat that I want to adjust and then use an arrow. And I personally have found this quite confusing to use. I still don't really understand which arrow does what, and again, why keep these physical buttons and not retain the buttons on the seat or on the side here for lumbar, bolster, cushion support? It's kind of frustrating. And the most frustrating thing of all that both myself and my wife have, have been annoyed by every single time is that at any point, if you adjust your seat here using the physical buttons, so I could be on Apple CarPlay, got my sat nav on and this happened a few times when my wife was driving she was closely following the sat nav we were driving somewhere unfamiliar but what happens is as soon as me in the passenger seat or the driver adjust their seat a seat display comes up here right over the sat nav and until you physically press the cross button as long as you're adjusting your seat it will stay there blocking what's on the screen now i haven't found a way to turn that off there may well be a way to turn it off but it's a really unnecessary and distracting feature and i don't know why it exists why does the driver need to know that the passenger is adjusting their seat we almost made a little bit of a joke of it to be honest every time i sort of moved my seat on the passenger side katie would sort of laugh at me saying moving your seat are you but i don't know why they've done that it's it's very annoying it's one thing if the driver's seat adjustment comes up on the screen or that doesn't really make sense but why does the driver need to know that the passenger is is moving their headrest up by two centimeters and at the expense of losing their satellite navigation very very odd now i do have more points to make about the general infotainment and technology in this car but i just want to make a few comments about fit and finish now obviously this will vary from car to car how they're specified but at the very least, this is a £100,000 car. So if there's any areas which I think it falls short, I'm going to mention them. So the first thing I notice, and this is something you can see from, well, my driving position, I can see it all the time, is there just seems to be a missing bit of finish down here. If you poke right at where the windscreen joins the top of the dashboard, you can see the sound deadening foam. So there's sort of a layer of, yeah, I guess it's foam, sound deadening material which looks like they forgot to cover it up with plastic leather or whatever they wanted to cover it with because you can just physically see it. And for me, that just looks a bit unfinished. Now, does it bother me every day? Absolutely not. Had I forgotten it was there after the first time I saw it? Yes, but it just seems quite bizarre and looks like I say, unfinished. I don't know why they've not covered up with some plastic or just made it look a little bit more deliberate. It looks like they forgot about it but I'll forget about that too. It's not the end of the world. Another thing that is kind of odd is the join here on this steering wheel. It sort of goes from plastic to this, well, probably more plastic, but metal effect plastic. And on the side of it here, it's really sharp. Now, when I've been driving with my thumbs in the middle or driving like this, using the new shape of the wheel to my advantage, I've caught myself a couple of times on where this plastic joins the metal and it's really sharp. Now, surely that is, you know, built properly. It was put together how it should be, but that's a real error, I think, because I've, yeah, caught myself on it a couple of times and am I gonna go to A&E about it? Absolutely not, but it does hurt. And I don't understand, you know, why that is like that. It seems again, 
like someone didn't check properly the fit and finish here on this steering wheel. I have to say it is a little bit worse on the left hand side than the right so it could just be this particular example but yeah if you're going to put in these indents where you can actually rest your hands and drive the car make it at least soft at the edges so that you don't cut yourself when you do so. But now my main issue with this steering wheel is, well, as with the later generations of Alfa Romeo 5, you've now got these sort of digital buttons. They, they change depending on what you're doing and what mode you're in. This always stays the same on the right. You have your cruise control options. And on the left, you have the ability to make a phone call or skip music, change the volume. And these change a little bit from mode to mode. However, as with later Alfa Romeo 5 models, it is just sort of one piece of plastic. And if you click it in the right place, you get the function you're desiring. But I found these buttons to be quite frustrating and unresponsive. For example, these skipping music buttons, the left and right, these, you generally, I'd say nine times out of 10, I have to click them twice because the first time it doesn't register. The only other way to skip music is going into the main screen itself, which is a big, big bore. And so yes, these are not responsive enough and you find yourself thinking, why is it not skipped? And you're having to click it again, sometimes three or four times before it actually skips the track. And even more importantly, and more annoyingly, it's the same with the cruise control. So you know when you're driving along on cruise control, you're not using the adaptive function and you wanna switch it off. And you don't wanna to have to press the brake to do it, you just wanna press cancel. And there's a button down here that says can, which is for cancel. The same situation applies where you click it once and nothing happens and you have to then deliberately look down and make sure you're clicking the right place and firmly, and then eventually it comes off. But again, in a driving situation, it's not very useful. It's just frustrating. They, they don't really, they're not responsive enough. And I found, every time I drive it, if I'm using the cruise control or I'm listening to music, which is more or less every time I drive the car, I find these buttons frustrating. I wish there was still a physical cruise control system, but I know that's not the way things are now, but I just feel these buttons, I don't know if it could be a software update or something later down the line, they're really unresponsive. Now, if you are an L460 owner yourself or you have experienced one, like I've been lucky enough to do so, I'd like to see if you agree with me because that was one thing that really did grind my gears. Now this main driver's display in front of me is, well, a little bit disappointing. There's not that much functionality in there. I feel like one of the things they could do is incorporate your Apple CarPlay into this screen so that you can have your navigation on this main screen and then use other functionalities on here such as the 4x4 mode. I'm a bit of a nerd and I like to see what elevation we're at and what direction we're pointing. And so I'd love to have this screen here on the main display because I can have my navigation here on the smaller driver's display, but that's not an option. In fact, you can go in here and select navigation to display on either the right or the left hand side, or you can have the whole screen displaying the navigation. But as far as I've been able to work out, you can't then adjust it using the buttons in here or on here you can't adjust the zoom at all. So having the navigation here, unless you're using the inbuilt stuff, is kind of pointless. Also the menus here on the driver's display, unlike the main screen, which is actually very responsive, a bit like an iPad, it's very good. These are really jittery and slow. And see here, I'm clicking the button and it's not, there we go. They're really slow. If I go here, display layout and change it, you can see it's sort of struggling to load and just not that great to use, especially if you're driving along and you wanna change the layout or have a look at your tire pressures. It's again, a very lazy, lethargic and complicated system here, unlike maybe an Audi, which is much, much more straightforward with a lot more functionality. I also find that the display is a little bit too small and in my sort of preferred driving position where I have my steering wheel and my seat, it actually cuts off the top of the screen. I wish that it was a little bit bigger or there was a bit more adjustability on the steering wheel so that it didn't get in the way. My only other point, and this is a very, very petty one, but I'm gonna include it because I want this review to sort of be quite in depth really and a bit nerdy and very picky, but it is just the armrest. Now, I'm very pleased to say they've kept the armrest and they've still kept the analog sort of twisty knob to adjust them. I absolutely love the armrest and they're still as fantastic as ever. However, the material on them is just a lot firmer than I remember from the previous generation. So much so that if like today I'm in a t-shirt and I'm resting my arm on here as I'm driving along, 
I actually have to find I have to keep removing my arm and sometimes rubbing the skin a bit because it's just really hard and not that comfortable. I've never had the problem with that before on previous generations. I find them to be quite soft and a nice place to rest the arm. Maybe I am just being a bit of a pansy and a massive wimp on this one, but it's just a minor observation. I've noticed the material on here is just a bit firmer and I found myself having to, yeah, sort of readjust quite a lot because I find it a little bit uncomfortable. So the truth is, honestly, there are quite a few things, minor or a little bit more problematic, that annoy me with this car. Now, previous generations are certainly not without their problems. The L322s, which I've had experience of owning, were very problematic in a lot of ways, but they had this sort of schoolboy class clown charm to them. You were sort of very annoyed by them a lot of the time, but actually you secretly found them really funny and you'd be a little bit annoyed and upset if they were taken away. I feel like the L322 sort of got away with a lot of stuff, but this latest generation seems to have lost a bit of that charm. So behind the wheel of the L460 Range Rover then, and it is, as you would expect, just the nicest driving experience, the best driving experience that I know of. And as per usual with Range Rover, you still have incredible visibility. You've got all of this glass, you've got the panoramic roof, but you've got a huge windscreen, huge windows to the side of you, and you really can see everything. I love driving a Range Rover at this time of year when the hedgerows are all populated with lots and lots and lots of greenery, but you can see over them because you've got that ride height with the Range Rover. And this latest generation just seems like another step forward in terms of refinement and comfort. I cannot begin to tell you how silent it is in this car. Even when cruising along at motorway speeds, I would say at 70 miles an hour, it feels like a normal car would at 20 or 30. It really is that impressive. This road I'm driving on now is also one of the worst that I use in terms of testing cars because the surface is so broken up and bumpy, yet we just drove over it as I was saying that and I barely noticed that you guys didn't either. It covers up the bumps and the lumps in the road so incredibly well, you can't quite believe what you're driving over. They have even gone a step beyond with certain models of Range Rover where you can option headrests that sort of pump, I think frequencies essentially, which further cancel the sound out. They're basically noise cancelling headrests. I'm pretty sure this car doesn't have those, but if it does, they're certainly doing their job very well. It's lovely to have a car that's this comfortable and quiet because you can have passengers in the back and have a conversation with them like you would in a normal room. My wife and I have said the reason that we so desperately want to get another Range Rover, and I think we definitely will after having this experience, is that it's almost like an extension of your home. When you have to make a long journey, it's no longer a chore. It's almost like extra time that we get to spend together and we enjoy it because we're in this environment that's as comfortable as it would be if we were just sat on our sofa at home, if not more comfortable. And so, when it comes to that sort of convenience and, and pleasure and comfort, Range Rover is, is worth every single penny, in my opinion. Now, as mentioned, we've done almost 2,000 miles in this car, maybe closer to 1,500. And although I reset the trip computer a little bit late, this is displaying 1,180 miles at 38.8 miles per gallon. And that has been a mixture, obviously largely uh, motorway driving, probably 800 miles of that was, was motorway on the way up and uh, back to Scotland. And then also lots of driving around, lots of pulling over, stopping, starting the engine again, accelerating. It's been a real mix. And so 38.8 miles per gallon as it currently reads, I think is very impressive. This particular model is the D300, the diesel. and. It's obviously very frugal. It's perfectly punchy when you want the power, when you're overtaking caravans, for example, when you are exploring Scotland. It's been absolutely sufficient for every need in terms of that. 
I do have a little bit of a complaint with this engine though, and I don't know if this would be the same on the other diesel cars or the hybrid versions, but it's very sort of slow to get away. And I think it's actually to do with the throttle response, which is why I think maybe it's a problem on other models as well. You're sort of pressed quite far down on the throttle pedal and, and nothing happens. And you press a little bit more and then the car suddenly accelerates. It's quite difficult to pull away gently. I just wish the null zone of this throttle pedal was a little bit less so that you could sort of get better feel from it. It's kind of difficult to, to judge. Also in terms of feel, and this is a bit of a, a big one, and I have to say after a week or so, I have gotten used to it and noticing it less, but above 30 or 35 miles an hour, the steering sort of artificially stiffens up so much so that when you're cruising along the motorway at 70 miles an hour, it feels a little bit like you're battling with the wheel when you're just trying to make those minor adjustments to, to stay in your lane. Now this will be something that's more or less impossible to demonstrate through this video on camera, but you have to take my word for it after driving lots of cars um, like this. It just sort of, yeah, stiffens up around 35 miles an hour. So now at 50, if it's just, again, there's, there's a lot of resistance in that first sort of 10 degree of turn, which you don't get at speeds under, under 35 miles an hour. So driving around town, you can really just drive this thing with your pinky and it's, it's absolutely lovely actually. I, just really, I think it really suits the car. It's really light. You've got four wheel steering now on these newer Range Rovers, which makes it uh, <laughs> unusually easy to turn really tight bends in something that's so big. Parking's quite, quite nice and easy. The auto parking function on this car is one of the best I've ever tried. But yeah, when you get up to speed, the, the steering just weights up and not in a nice way, it's in a sort of frustrating, distracting way. And yeah, I, I don't find it very pleasant. So I did find when I did a couple of hundred miles before going to Scotland in this car on, on a run, I found it quite tiring trying to fight the wheel at 70 miles an hour. So in all honesty, it's something I, I'm noticing less, I have to say, after a week or so driving this car. But it was something that was very apparent to me when I first did some miles on it. And I, I just wonder if anyone else has, has noticed what I'm talking about. A smaller general issue I've noticed is, well, you've got great storage, to be honest. There's one, two, three adaptable cubbies. You can change whether you have cup holders or you have a bigger storage area in the center here. You do have a fridge, but of course you can store anything in there when the fridge is off. You've got these big pockets, but they're really hard to reach. The, the gap between the seat and the sort of door frame that you need to put your hand through to get to the cubby is too tight for me to put my hand in. So if I do have anything in there, I've had some tissues right down in the bottom of this cubby, it's a real pain actually to try and get them. It's actually literally a real pain. It hurts actually trying to get in there. So although you can put quite a lot in them, they're not particularly easy to access if you're driving the car. The only other minor observation I've had is I was driving at night and I wanted to make sure the lights were, were on. There's obviously an auto function on these. And I still, even to this day, cannot work out for the life of me how you do it. It's sort of this system where you, you pull it, but then as soon as you let go, it flicks back into the neutral position. And I think what you do is pull it as far as auto and then release, and then they're in auto. But it's certainly not very clear, and I still haven't quite worked it out. I feel like this new design is a bit needlessly complicated. Also, just on the lights, this, as many new cars will have, has an auto full beam or high beam function. You sort of push forward once and it will come up with a little auto display. And so when there's nothing coming the other way, the full beams will automatically come on. And when something comes the other way towards you, they won't necessarily fully switch off but they sort of have lots of little lights within that switch off to create a small area around that car so that you're not blinding or dazzling the oncoming driver. However, this car doesn't seem to do that very well because although from time to time in say an Audi Q8 or something, the adaptive headlights do intrude on the other driver, you get flashed by the other driver because they're saying you're blinding me and you need to turn your full beams off. 
it does happen from time to time. In this car, it happens every single time. It's almost like they're not switching off enough. You can see the box that it makes around the oncoming car where it turns off the high beam, but obviously other drivers just find these lights extremely dazzling and so much so that I just don't bother using the auto full beam function anymore because, well, I was getting sick of being flashed by every single driver that was coming towards me. So I feel like they could probably do something there to make them a little bit more sensitive so that you can actually use them without being flashed by every car oncoming and it really is every car uh, the other night when we were driving down a country road everyone was becoming dazzled by these lights and i promise you i was in the correct mode they just seem to be a little bit too bright or don't turn off enough in terms of the auto high beam function and that really is it in terms of, of my complaints i feel like i'm trying not to be too nitpicky or sound like i'm just moaning this is still by far and away if i could choose one car to have brand new right now it would almost certainly be one of these so everything i've mentioned although some of which are quite annoying and sometimes problematic for me they would not be enough to deter me from from buying this car altogether let's talk about some great points number one the heads up display on this car is absolutely fantastic it's really clear it's really bright. It doesn't like polarized sunglasses, so that's a little bit uh, frustrating, but you can have everything on there. It will come up with the name of the song that's coming on. You can have all of the cruise control and safety guidance stuff on there, which I found really, really useful. And it's just brilliant, a very, very good heads up display. Now, I didn't think I'd like this, but I've learned to really, really uh, love it and find it very useful. The electronic rear view mirror. So now there's a camera on the back of the car that is your rear view mirror. Now you can flip it here and just have the conventional mirror back, but I've learned to really enjoy using this. You can click here and change the brightness and uh, change the settings a little bit, but it's really clear. It gives you all, almost the same view you would have anyway with the conventional mirror, but just a bit more. And also something I found out the other day is that when we were driving back from Scotland and the parcel shelf was all loaded up with all that extra stuff, actually it didn't matter i thought well i'm not gonna be able to see out the back now because the parcel shelf is full of stuff but because the camera for the electric mirror is obviously on the back of the car it doesn't matter how much you load up your parcel shelf shelf sorry you can still see everything you need to so that's a real big bonus i know this is not the first car in the world to have an electric rear view mirror it's the first one i've ever experienced and i think it's really very good the feel of the flappy paddles on the back of the wheel here lovely absolutely fantastic really solid and expensive feeling however i've never used them you literally never feel the need to use them it might be different in one of the v8 models for example but in this d300 i've never once this is literally the first time i've used the paddles other than just clicking them for the satisfaction of clicking them because they do feel very nice so i wish there was more of a use for it but no not at all and just in the drivetrain and the powertrain itself, the gearbox, we've got an eight speed, absolutely fantastic, flawless as you would expect. You really don't feel the gear changes whatsoever. As I mentioned, the engine's a little bit lethargic to respond from a standstill, but other than that, it's absolutely fantastic. I might go for the D350 if it was me, just to give you that little bit of extra power and torque. There's sometimes here like on this hill where you feel the car having to change down to maintain speed. So maybe just a slightly more powerful option would be preferable. I think that's the way I would go. My only minor complaint with this engine otherwise is it's quite a noisy one. Now the sound deadening is so spectacular in this car that it's very rarely ever an issue. But if you do have your window open or you sort of start the car up in the morning, you're quite aware of how clackety it is. And it is a bit of a noisy engine. You do hear it from time to time, but you know, never really gonna be bothersome, is it? The seats themselves are as good as they've ever been. Extremely soft, semi-aniline leather, really, really adjustable, despite them being adjustable within here. And it's very frustrating to use. You can adjust them in every which way you would ever want to. 
and so doing an eight or nine hour drive as we did the other day up to the highlands of Scotland was a mere breeze. I mean, completely pain-free, comfortable. We felt totally refreshed when we got there, which I've never quite experienced before. Really, really no complaints in terms of the comfort department. Like previous Range Rover generations as well, and Matt from High Peak Autos says it best, but it is very true that you can jump into any Range Rover and you just sort of immediately feel successful. And that is definitely still the case with this one. But it also gave you a sense of sort of feeling quite proud as well to be in a Range Rover, almost like you're being a patriot and supporting the badge of Britain almost. You know, the Queen had many Range Rovers through her long and beautiful life. However, this one's slightly different in the sense that I feel almost a little bit self-conscious and embarrassed to be driving this, uh, especially when it's clean and, and sunny like this. I do feel a little bit like in your face with this car. It feels very much more Chelsea Tractor than other generations have felt prior. And so I wouldn't say I feel sort of proud to be driving around in this. I feel almost a little bit obnoxious at times. Now, it's not a reason obviously to deter you from buying one, but just a minor observation I've had in terms of the reaction that it gets from your punters and your people walking down the street. You sort of get many more looks of disgust than, than you did in the older generations. And I think it is just because of the styling and, and maybe because people are more aware these days of how valuable and expensive these Range Rovers are to buy. Maybe the type of people that buy them too could have a part to play in it. But just a very minor observation that you do feel quite aware of uh, people not being so happy with you driving such a luxurious, expensive SUV these days. Whereas I think the older ones get away with it a bit more because they're just much more rugged in, in uh, appearance. Now this is never the car for performance, but it does drive in a way that something this heavy and this big has absolutely no right to. If I throw it into these corners here at 50 miles an hour, the way it just handles them, and these are not flat, smooth corners either, they're all over the place, but it just goes round them in a way where if I did it in one of my old L322s, the thing would probably be on its roof. This thing just is very mighty impressive in the way that it handles. And to summarize the car as a whole, it is absolutely wonderful and still a car that I aspire to own one day. Something that if I had the money, I would go to my nearest dealer right now and, and order one. It really is that good and it still captures the heart of me a Land Rover, Range Rover enthusiast. It, it still gives me that same giddy sensation that I'm getting into a Range Rover. They've retained enough of the beloved quirks and features of Range Rovers of old to still give me that feeling. There are things I don't like that I've talked about in quite a lot of detail in this video, mostly to do with the infotainment system and the way in which you're forced now to go through all of these screens to access what I would say are quite essential Range Rover features, such as that air suspension thing. But despite all that, it's still a car I would absolutely want to see on my driveway every day. And actually the thing I'm looking forward to the very least is handing back the keys to the out when they come to collect this. And if you don't know about the Out or you've missed any of the previous videos where I've spoken about them, they are an exclusively Jaguar Land Rover rental service. But the key thing with them is that once you sort of pay the price for your rental, everything's included. Unlimited mileage, additional drivers, fully comprehensive insurance and lots, lots more. So do go to their website and check them out. They offer almost every single uh, model of Land Rover or Range Rover. And they do also have Jaguar F-Types, which is something I'd love to get my hands on in the not too distant future. So as before, a huge thank you to the Out for supplying me with this car and allowing me to experience the L460 over a really meaningful period of time. 
I feel like I've really got under the skin of this thing and I, I truly understand it. And so hopefully with that, I've been able to provide you some meaningful insights onto what it's like living with one of these L460 Range Rovers and you know where they've gone with it and how it's changed from the previous generations. So I do hope you've enjoyed this video. Thank you so much for watching, especially if you've made it this far. Let me know what you think in the comments. Make sure to give this video a like. Follow me on Instagram if you want to see daily content. All the links are in the description. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you very, very soon.